Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Tess above. If she went from her husband's grave to her father's house, or if she went back to her father-in-law's house but was not made an administrator, um, the heirs cannot impose an oath upon her. If she became an administrator, Tick, the heirs can impose an oath upon her concerning the future, but they cannot impose an oath upon her concerning the past. If a woman impairs a ketubah, she is not paid except with an oath. If one witness testifies against her that it is paid, she is not paid except with an oath. From property of orphans, from assigned property, or from his absence, she is not paid except with an oath. And here we're talking about a shavua, correct? Uh, we're talking about that she's got to take a shavua. Well, um, we'll see in the next mission more explicitly what this oath entails. Uh, but basically, to say that she, that she hasn't already claimed part of her kasuba or the whole thing. If she impairs her ketuba, how? Uh, the ketuba was a thousand zuz, and he said to her, "You have received your ketuba," and she says, "I have received only a hundred. She is not paid except with an oath. If one witness testifies against her that it is paid, how?" If a ketubah was a thousand zuz and he said to her, you received your ketubah and she says, I have not received it. And one witness testifies against her that it is paid. She is not paid except with an oath. From a signed property, how? If he holds his property to others and she seeks to be paid for the, by the purchasers, she is not paid except with an oath. From the property of orphans, how? If, she, if, if he died and left the property to orphans and she seeks to be paid by the orphans, she is not paid except with an oath. Or in his absence, how? If he went overseas and she seeks to be paid with his absence, she is not paid except with an oath. Rem Shimon says, whenever she claims a ketubah, the heirs can impose an oath upon her. But if she does not claim a ketubah, the heirs cannot impose an oath upon her. Okay. okay. If she produced the bill... Now it's my turn. You're um, Okay. I went that fast. I went that fast. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. But see, I get so now if she if she produces a get, uh, but ain't imo kasuba and she doesn't have the the star kasuba anymore. Nonetheless, uh, she uh, the fact that she has a get from from her husband is enough to prove that she has a star that she has a kasuba, which is a is a, is a massive. It's a it's a tanai based in that even if she didn't have a kasuba at all, uh, her husband still owes her the money. Okay, the two hundreds is for for basula. Gova bis kasuba sa. So then she can connect, uh, collect her kasuba. If she produces a kasuba, and she produces the kasuba, no get. He omers, and she says, I lost my, I lost my get. And he, and he counterclaims, no, I lost my, I, I paid, basically I paid you out and, and, and you gave me a receipt and now I lost the receipt. Um, similarly, as, so what? Uh, so the, the halach is that you're not going to be able to claim this. And similar case is a bal chov, shehotzi shtar chov. So the, the creditor pulls out the the shtar chov, and it's been over and it's been over a shmita year, went over the rosh hashanah, but any more prosbol, so he doesn't have the prosbol anymore. So now he claims that no, I had a prosbol, but I lost the prosbol, and the creditor and the debtor says no, you, you never had a prosbol. There's no, uh, the, 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 the claim is not good enough and they, they cannot uh, force payment. Rabban Shem bin Gamli Lomer, Minas Eilech, says there was a time in history when the Romans were persecuting Jews and not allowing them to have any kind of religious documents. So therefore, the, the Kasuva and the Get were all dangerous things to help hold on to. So from that time, Isha Goba Kesuba Sashiloba Get, a woman can collect her Kesuba without having the get. And the and the creditor can claim even without having a pros ball. Okay, Shne Gitin Ushte Kesubos. Now here's a case uh, where the where the woman has got has got two gitin from this husband and she's got two kasubas. So what happened? Obviously, he he married her and he divorced her. And Mustama paid out the first kasuba. Then he and then he then he married her again, gave her a new kasuba, and uh, and now he's divorced her again. So she's got. Hey, on, on, I'm sorry. On the, uh, she gets a new kasuba because this is on the condition of the first kasuba he remarries her. But no, okay, you you've read ahead. You you've jumped you've jumped to the next. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Shnei getin or shnei kasuba. So you've got two getin and two kasubas. Gova right. She has the right to claim both of the kasubas, um, because uh, 
uh, but it has to be the it has to be the case that the the, the date that's written on the on the uh, on the on the first kasuba is before the first get, and that the second kasuba is dated after the first get. Okay, so that, so they're two separate uh, contracts. Okay, so she can collect on on both of uh, both of these marriages. She can claim on both kasubas. Now, what happens if she has shtei kasubas for get echad? She has two kasubas and only one get. Okay, or kasuba ushnei getin, or she has one kasuba and two getin. Or kasuba the get umisa, or she's got one kasuba, one get, and uh, and one death certificate from uh, from her husband. Okay, ena gova ela kasuba achas. In all of these cases, she only gets to collect one kasuba. Right? Why? She amagarish es ishto ubeichzira because if a man divorces his wife and then remarries her, nistama almanas kasuba harishana machzira. It's uh, it, it's. Uh, it's basically returning to the conditions of the first of the first kasuba. So you, you wouldn't. It, it doesn't make sense for the man to have uh, to have made a, made a second kasuba. So let's just say you're talking about it started with two hundred zuz when the first time he married her, and he divorces her. Now, if he's going to if he if he's like made up his mind completely, he's divorcing her, and then he pays her out. Fine. So he's paid her out. Then uh, he's paid her out of two hundred, and now. He, if he decides to remarry her again, now he's only going to have a kasuba of one hundred. So then, if he divorces her again, she'll have another. She'll never have another one hundred. Okay. But if if he if he married her again, if he divorced her once and then decided, you know what, you know what, let me just take her back. He doesn't have to. The, the assumption is that he did it based on on the single kasuba because he doesn't want to pay out twice if he wants to remarry her. He's not going to pay out a kasuba then remarry her. Okay. Okay, katan shehesio aviv. Now, what happens if you have a um, a young a, a young boy whose uh, whose father uh, gave him in marriage, basically, which is a katan shehesio aviv, and he and he grew up. Um, so, uh, what exactly is that case now? If he's because because a katan a katan can't. Uh, can't marry until he is bar mitzvah. It's just his kinyan is ineffective. So uh, I guess he was he was ah uh, 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 he says probably means that his uh, that his father his father underwrote the kasuba because his, you know a thirteen year old boy is probably not going to have much to to put onto a kasuba. Okay, kasuba sakayemis. Now his wife's kasuba. Uh, uh, is still is still in place. She almanas came kiyama. Okay, from, from the time that, that he, from when he grows up, he, uh, and now he's still got this. He's still got his wife uh, on um, on the basis of this kasuba that is uh, that was written for him when he was younger. Okay. Um. Uh, okay, so so there's an interesting question that Tospas raises on this. Is like, isn't that obvious? The this, this statement should be completely obvious that you know, even after she, after she grows up, she gets a kasuba. I mean, that's a, that's it's my based in that every woman has a has a kasuba. So why would you have thought not? So the question, right. so the thing is that because uh, uh, he, they were married when he was young. Uh, and now he, now he grows up and he has to take over the responsibility of the kasuba himself. He might say, no, but uh, that was, uh, you know, I wasn't responsible for her when, when, when I first married her. Now she's no longer a basula, so now she, she, she shouldn't be able to claim 100 if it is a time uh -huh. Okay. Um, so the Mishnah carries on. So if, if if uh, a non-Jewish couple converts, kasuba sakayemis she almanas kem kima, so her kasuba is still in place. Um, so what does it mean? As it was, it, 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 because even the non-Jews write some some sort of uh, prenup, and uh, as even so, what they wrote when they when they were non-Jews is still is still binding on them because it's. Uh, 
And he, carried, he, he's, he stayed with his wife on the base of this kasuba. Uh, some explain that this is uh, that the kasuba that, that, that exists is the kasuba of a mane, because she's a because obviously she as a gioris she's uh, she's only entitled to one hundred zuz in her kasuba, but that is also part of the the tenai based in that uh, that any woman gets. So even if even if they didn't have a even if they didn't have a kasuba initially. Um, then she gets, uh, then she nonetheless gets the, gets the 100 zoos. Okay, very good. Before you go, a quick question. In today's world, when someone gets divorced and they go to bed, the whole thing, and they get, they, they give them the, they, the woman gets the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the ketubah, uh, not the ketubah, the, um, um, yeah, my head, right. Okay. She, um, so what happened? Is this money that's passed? The, the husband has to pay the money that's in the ketubah. Correct. Yes. yes. Does he do it at the bezdin? Does he do it there, or is it or like hand over the money? No, it's, it's it just becomes a debt that he has to pay her. Eventually, okay. Because when I when I was that, that when I was a uh, um, observer, you know, and I had to be there with a witness for the the two that had divorced, I didn't see any money change hands no. or any checks or anything. I just, you know, no. Um, no. So I don't. Um, look, I, I'm really really not an expert in getting at all. So um, I, can't, uh, I can't really comment on it, um, but it's um, yeah. The, the get, as you say, I don't think I don't think they necessarily have to. The money has to change hands at the at the at the get. They just right. have to. He just has to give her the get, and then he's got it. Then he's got a fob that he's now got to pay her. He's got to pay her. So, and if he does it, then she can go back to the business and do whatever they have to do. Okay. All right. Just want to clear that up. Okay. Okay. So there's a man who's got two wives, a mace, and now he dies. Okay. So his first wife has first dibs on his estate before the second wife because she's got the uh, she's got the earlier dated star against him. She's got the earlier discovery. Right. And similarly, the heirs of the first wife have got first dibs on, on the property. Uh, over the the second ones, so this is talking about if you've got a um, a star, when, when the, the the part of the of the kasuba that that specifically states that that her heirs, her children, will inherit this property first. Remember, we have that in the kasuba where, like, the father-in-law wants to give a nice gift. It's Almanas that his uh, that his biological grandchildren will inherit this property eventually. Not that it's going to go down a different stream of the husband of, of right. the son-in-law's family. Okay, so now if the if the estate isn't enough to cover the uh, the claims of both sets of heirs, then the then the, the Yorshim of the first wife have the have the have the first claim. Nasai mm Sarishana -hmm. Vamesa, if he married the first woman and then she died, Nasashnia Umeshu. And then he married the second woman, and uh, and then he died. Shnia the Yorsheha Kodmin the Yorsheha Rishona. So then the second wife and and her children have got precedence over the, the heirs of the first one of, of the first woman. Okay, so again, this is where the first wife died. So what happens when the first wife dies? Who inherits her? Is her husband. Right. Okay. So her husband uh, has now has now inherited the the kasuba. Now we have a now we have a second wife, okay, and the and the second wife now also has children, okay, and then and then the and then the then the husband dies, so now and he's left over in a state that's not enough to cover the claims of both sets of heirs. So now, what? Why is this that this the second wife and her heirs have the first claim? Because the second one is a is like a creditor. Uh, she's uh, she's a creditor because her because her, uh, she has to have a kasuba that's paid out of the estate, and her and the yorshim her children are coming to claim the uh, claim the debt that's owed to their mother, whereas the the yorshim of the first of the first wife are claiming are claiming the kasuba span in different right they're claiming the the portion of the of of the old kasuba that's uh, that's due to them, but their their tavia is only a tavia of yerusha because they they're now they're now uh, then are Yorshim as opposed to creditors. And creditors get paid uh, before right, Yorshim. Right. 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 Okay. That's a, that, that just makes sense that a, that a creditor must be paid before a before an heir. 
So the, in today's world, in today's world, I think the heirs get first. I'm sorry, the I think creditors the one that gets last usually. In no, today's the heir, world, the heirs, the heirs will take over whatever's left. Right. Because the, heir, the heirs is just like a blanket. It's just it's just like one big basket that, that everything falls into that hasn't been claimed by uh, by creditors. So, so the, the widow is a, is, is a creditor here. So she is claiming it as a Balkhor. And so she has first dibs. And then, and then the, uh, only after that, the Yorshin uh, come first. Now, now, now why, did the, why do her Yorshin come, uh, uh, her, her Yorshin come before the, the Yorshin of the, um, of the first wife? Let's just see that again here and put in Yorsha. Look at Golden Sekhilata Arisha, the Yorsha. So it says, so Kati explain, explains, uh, to be clear, that the, the Yorshim of the second wife uh, cannot claim the, 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 the um, they can only claim it if, they, if their mother swears on her kusuba, because that, um, that, that she has to take a shivua that she hasn't already received her kusuba, because, we, because now they, this is a claim against the, against the other Yorshim. Okay, no, that, that's a different that's a different subject. So I'm, I'm not sure why the why the Yorshim of the second wife would have a would have a the only claim that they can have. Ah, I think I think what they're saying is that why why would a Yorshim have a second um the Yorshim would have a second um uh, uh What's the claim? No, the claim is only on a kasuba. So if he died and then subsequently she died, then then the, the Yorshim would come first. But otherwise, it's going to follow laws of the Yorshim, including the Shtarban and Zephyrin. Is this clear? Yeah, she, has to take, she has to take an oath. On this. She, she, has, she, has, she would have to take an oath that she hasn't received any other kasuba because the, the, the Yorshim of the first wife are going to say, well, how come you're taking your kusuba? Take it. We want to know that you haven't already been paid out part of your kusuba. So they can when they when they uh, um, when when they when she produces her kusuba and 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 she says, you know, I received this money. Does that have to be? Does she have to sign for that? You know, like I all right, I received yeah, my yes, money. There, so there's a shova. See, right. she gives a when uh, she gives a shova to the um, to the husband. If he's divorcing her, or to his yorshim, if uh, if if it's from uh, from from being widowed, so that's a proof right there. Right, that's a, it's a receipt. It's a right, receipt right. that she has received right. money. Okay, Mishnah base. Misha hayam nasoy shtei nashim. So again, he's got two wives, the mesu, and uh, and his two wives both died. The achakaf mesu, and then afterwards the the uh, the father dies. And now the, uh, the orphans are coming to claim the kusuba of their respective mothers. And the and the and the and the and the, and the estate has only got as much as will cover exactly the two kusubas. Okay, so in other words, uh, two hundred zuz for each wife. So now the. Remember, there's the Shtarban and Dechrin as well. Mm -hmm. right? so, so let's say one of, the, one of the grandfathers left a huge sum and the other one left a lesser sum. So the, so the grandchildren of the, of the wealthy grandfather are saying, we want, uh, we want a bigger portion of the Yerusha. And, right. uh, um, but now the, all that's left, all that's, that, that's in the estate is enough to cover the basic kasuba of, of 200 zuz each. So now they have to, they have to split it evenly. Um, right, all they can do is take the take what's the what's according to the the, the basic kalacha. Hayasham mosa dina. Now, what happens if there is one dina extra left over in the estate? So you've got two kasubas and one dina. Elenotin kasubas iman, but elenotin kasubas iman. Right. So if there's so one one dina extra, um, you know different. Okay, so then 
Hmm. Hold on. Wait, I, have, I, have, I need to make sure I got the first case right because now this is not making sense to me. Oh, wow. So, okay, so now I, I got the first case wrong. So, what we've got is let's say you've got um, uh, a total kasuba for the for the one for the one wife, including the star bandirin, is a thousand dinars, and the the total of the of the other of the other wife is only five hundred. Okay, and now the you've got exactly fifteen hundred dinars in the in the kasuba or less. So now, if the if they try and if, if they split the the Yerusha, exactly according to the uh, according to what's what's stipulated in the Kasubas between all of the Orshim, then there's not going to be anything left to fulfill the Torah din of Yerusha. So that 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 the money has to be split between between all of the sons. There, right? There's a Torah din of Yerusha. So you want to be able to keep the Torah din of Yerusha, and therefore the um, the Shtar Banim Dechen is overridden. And the and the, the money falls to all of the Yorshim equally as if it's a, as if it's a Yorshim. Obviously, if there's a if there's a before, then the before will take double. Right. Okay. okay. Now, um, so now what we're then saying is in the in the second case is that there's one dinar left over. So now there's one thousand five hundred and one dinars in the in the in the in the estate. Then you get thousand dinars falling to the first one and five hundred to the second one, and then that last dinar. They split it up um, according to the, the Tory laws of Yerusha. So because now you've got that one dinner that you can say, okay, so we're going to get, use the Tory rules of, of Yerusha on that, everything's fine. Okay, now what happens if we return to the, to the first case where there's exactly 1,500 in the Yerusha? Right. So now the, the children who, who, who do the 1,000 dinners and look at look at each other and say, look, if we if we try and claim the full thousand uh, the full thousand dinars, we're not going to get anything. We, we're just going to get the the regular lot. So you know, you know, we'll be generous. So we'll be mavater one dinar on our on our Yerusha. Basically, we're going to treat it as if there's an extra, uh, and we'll we'll only claim. 999 dinars from the start. So now there's one dinar over there that can fall to regular Yerusha, and now we can claim 999 dinars. Okay, nice try. Then We don't listen to them. The estate has to be uh, has to be evaluated in Bastin, and they have to take the evaluation uh, fairly because you know you can't. It's, it's all very well to be marachim on the on the kids who've got the who've got the larger Yerusha, but then you're taking away from the from the kids who've got the smaller right. Yerusha. So they've got so the so the based in just uh, says thanks, nice try, but no. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, right. Back to Zion Gimel. If one pronounces a vow on his wife that she should not adorn herself with a certain item, he must divorce her and give her the kasuba. Rabbi Yossi says, in the case of poor women, if he did not give a limit in the case of rich women, 30 days. If one pronounces a vow on his wife that she should not go to her father's house when he is with her in the city one month, he may keep her two months. He must divorce her and give her the kasuba. When he is in another city, one festival, he may keep her. Three festivals, he must divorce her and give her the ketuba. If one pronounces a vow on his wife that she should not go to a house of mourning or to a house of fasting, a feasting, he must divorce her and give her the ketuba because he locks the door before her. But if he claims that it was due to some other course, he may. He said to her, on the condition that you tell so-and-so that you, what you said to me or what I said to you or that you fill up and pour out into the garbage, he must divorce her and give her the ketuba. If someone was married to two minor orphans and died, if the Yavim cohabitated with the first one and then with the second one, or his brother cohabitated with the second one, he did not disqualify the first one. So too, in the case of two deaf mutes, if one was a minor, if, if one was a minor and one was a deaf mute, if the Yavim cohabitated with the minor 
And then with the deaf mute, or with his brother, or if his brother then cohabitated with the deaf mute, he did not disqualify the minor. If the Yavim cohabitated with the deaf mute and then with the minor, or his uh, brother cohabitated with the minor, he disqualified the deaf mute. If one was competent and one was deaf mute, if the Yavim cohabitated with a competent one and then with the deaf mute, or his brother cohabitated with the deaf mute, he was not disqualify the comp he did not disqualify the competent one. If the Yavim cohabitated with the deaf mute and then with the competent one, or if his brother then cohabitated with the co competent one, he disqualified the deaf mute. Seems from this that everybody is cohabitating with each other. Uh, <laughs> Need one more. Skip one. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. The eleven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If one was an adult and one was a minor, if the Yavim cohabitated with the adult and then with the minor, or if his brother then cohabitated with the minor, it did not disqualify the adult. The Yavim cohabitated with the minor and then with the adult, or his brother then cohabitated with the adult, he disqualified the minor. But Elazar says we teach the minor to refuse him. Mm -hmm. That's your promise. Every, everyone's cohabitating with each other and dying. <laughs> Okay, uh, base uh, test. Uh, the pepper grinder cannot contract tumor contamination as three can't, utensils. Uh, can't, can't. Uh, I'm sorry? Can, can. right? He, the the pepper grinder can contract tumor contamination as three utensils as a receptacle, as a metal utensil, and as a sieve. The child's toy, toy wagon is susceptible to midris contamination and it may be moved on Shabbos, but it may not be dragged over the ground except over cloth. Rabbi Huda says no utensil may be dragged over the ground except the wagon, wagon because it only presses. We may not catch fish from a fish pond on Yom Tov, nor may we place food before them, but we may catch animals or fowl from enclosures and we may, and we may put food before them. Rabbi Shimon Gagamil says not all enclosures are the same. This is the general rule. Whatever requires trapping is prohibited and whatever does not require trapping is, prohibited, is permitted. Maestras. Okay. Olive Zion. Wine. After it has been skimmed, though it has been skimmed, you may collect from the upper wine press and from the duck and drink. Oil. When it descends into the trough, though it may be descended, it has descended, he may take from the press basket and from between the pressing stone and the pressing boards and put it on a cake or dish, but he may not put it into a pan or saucepan while they are boiling. Rabbi Yehuda says he may put it into anything except into what contains vinegar or brine. A cake of figs, when he has smoothed it down, one may smooth down with figs or grapes of tevel. Rabbi Yehuda forbids. If it is smoothed down with grapes, it is not rendered susceptible to uncleanliness. Rabbi Yehuda says it is rendered susceptible. Dried figs, when they are stamped down or in a store bin when they are pressed together, or if one was stamping down in a jar or pressing together in a store bin, and the job broke or the store been open, he may not eat from them a chance meal. Reb Yossi permits. If one was passing through the street and said, take yourselves some, take for yourselves some figs, they may eat and are exempt. Therefore, if they brought them into their houses, they tied them as definite. Take and bring them into your houses, they may not eat them, them a chance meal. Therefore, if they took them into their houses, they tied only as to my. Olios. Okay. Test Vav Gibel. In the case of barrels that are outdoors, standing upright or lying on their sides, which touch one another by a square hand breath, or if there, or if there is tumor underneath one barrel, tumor penetrates directly up and directly down. In what cases is applied when the barrels are tahor? However, if there are tume or a hand breath above the ground, there is tumor underneath one of them, the area beneath all of them becomes tume. In the case of a house divided by boards or curtains from the sides or from the joists, if there is tumor inside the house, utensils inside the partition section remain tahor. And if there is tumor inside the partition section, utensils inside the house become tume. When there are utensils inside the partition section, if there is a cubed hand breadth, they become tume. If not, they remain tahor. When the partition is built on the floor and tumor is inside the partition section, utensils inside the house become tume. When tumor is inside the house and utensils are inside the part uh, partition section, if the area containing the utensils is a hand breadth by a hand breadth, 
and a hand breath high, the utensils remain tahor. If not, they become tame because the floor of the house goes as deep as one can go, like the house. Okay. And, okay, Dalav Chetz. If one may, one may buy a trodden wine press from an idolater, even though he takes with his hand and places it in the mouth, and he does not become Nesek wine until he descends into the cistern. If it descended to the cistern, that which is in the cistern is prohibited and the remainder is permitted. One may tread with an idolater in the wine press, but one may not harvest grapes with him. If a Jew processes his fruit in a state of tuma, one may not tread, nor may one harvest grapes with him, but one may transport barrels to the wine press with him and carry away from the wine press with him. If a baker processes in tuma, one may not knead or roll dough with him, but one may transport breed, a bread to the retail, retailer with him. If an idolater was found standing beside a wine cistern, if he has a lean upon it, it is prohibited. If he doesn't have a lean upon it, it's permitted. If he fell into the cistern and came out, or he measured it with a reed, or he flipped out a hornet with the reed, or if he was tapping on top of a foaming barrel, all these cases were actual incidents, and they said it should be sold. Reb Shimon, however, permits, if he took a barrel and threw it in his anger into the cistern, this was once an incident, and they declared it fit. Okay. Okay. Okay, have a great day. Enjoy. Okay, and I will see you on Mitzvah tomorrow, Wednesday. Okay.